So, hello everyone. Very nice to be here and happy to be part of this celebration of ABB Estonia 20 years. So, I'm Thomas Lagerberg and I'm heading the automation research at ABB Sweden. So, I will talk a little bit about future because that is what we do at corporate research. So, some technologies that might influence future uh, automation is the topic. When you talk about the future, it's very important that you know what the future will look like. I mean, these are some interesting quotes from people who thought that they knew what the future was like. I mean, you have the chairman of IBM who said that maybe there is a world market for five computers. Maybe underestimated the market. Or a founder of digital equipment. They were a leading computer supplier in the 70s, 60s, in the 80s. He said, I can see no reason why anyone would like to have a computer in the home. They are out of the business now. They were bought by HP. Not very strange, perhaps. Or we have in, the, in Sweden, we had an IT responsible minister who said in 96 that this internet thing, that is probably not very interesting. That is just a bus that will fly over because no one wants to spend so much time in front of the computer. That was not really correct. So when you t think about the future, you need to have an open mind because things that you th know are true today might not be true tomorrow. So we need to have an open mind when we th think about the future for automation. What are we doing at ABB then? Well, of course you know what we're doing at ABB. I have a very simplified uh, view of what we do at ABB. We make sure that the two holes in the wall are not just two holes in the wall, but out of these two holes you get some safe environment environmental friendly electricity. And then we also make sure that the factories in this world can really produce what they want to do in a very efficient, very sustainable and a very safe way. So we are 65,000 people working with this and 65,000 people working with this. That is a very, my very simplistic mind of ABB. So power and productivity for a better world. That is our slogan. Well, this guy you might not recognize. This is a very famous guy in Sweden. He's part of a children's show called Five Ants Are More Than Four Elephants. It's like the Sesame Street of Sweden. So every child in Sweden knows this guy. And he had a box of, or a box of tricks. So one feature in, in this show was that he put up four animals and one of them did not belong. There was one odd animal. And I don't have animals, but I have gadgets. So I actually have a bag of, of uh, tricks here. A bag of tricks. And I have four quite interesting things. I have such a thing, and you probably know what this is. So I put it here. I have uh, such a gadget, also quite interesting. Uh, I have this thing, which you might not recognize what it is. And I have a fourth one. This which you probably haven't seen before. It's a very interesting gadget. So one of these do not belong here, but we will come back to that later. When you talk about automation, it's very important to realize that things happen around us, not in the industry, but in the gaming industry, in the computing industry, in the mobile telephone industry, that are affecting us, that are going to affect us even more in the future. So this we need to be aware of. We need to monitor all that is happening around us. So that is one reason why we have this corporate research. As uh, Velomate uh, talked, uh, told you, we have some research facilities all around the globe. Uh, and I'm coming from the research center in Vestros, which is represents around one third of the corporate research facility within ABB. So when you talk about automation, what is important in automation? Well, important is that things have to work. They have to work around the clock, day out, day in. Because when something stops in an industrial plant, it can mean that you lose production for thousands or tens of thousands of dollars every hour. So things need to work. Safety, of course. I mean, in, in a nuclear power plant or a chemical plant or whatever, it's obvious that personal safety is more important than everything else. Also, cybersecurity and real-time behavior, and also the fact that automation systems and products, they are expected to live for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. 
even though we base it to some extent on commercial consumer technology. So all this we need to really have in the back of our minds. All the time when you work with automation, industrial applications, we need to keep this in mind. This is the basis for everything we do. Then on top of this, we need to provide the things that are easy to use, very efficient, very a lot of features, etc. So this we must never forget. Now we'll talk about some of the interesting areas that will affect the future of automation. Wireless communication is one thing, for instance. I mean, we're all used to using mobile phones, etc. But if you go out to an industrial plant, the environment can be really tough. I mean, you can have a lot of disturbances. You can have high temperatures, low temperatures, humidity, corrosive gases, motors turning on and off, so enormous electromagnetic disturbances, etc. So you need to have technologies that really can cope with these environments. So we need to take advantage of what is available out there, all the developments that is done in wireless communication, but adapt it to industrial needs to make sure that we can really withstand all the, the disturbances, that we in turn do not disturb, that you can have a lot of equipment that can coexist, that you can uh, further extend your plant, that it's easy to use, and that it's cheap, of course. So all this must be taken into account. Uh, some years ago, we worked on, on adapting Bluetooth and Zigbee technology for use in industrial applications. So we developed a uh, communication protocol called VISA, Wireless Interface for Sensors and Actuators. And ABB has released some products based on this VISA technology. We have some proximity sensors, some input output devices, some communication equipment. Nothing special, you might think. But there is one very specific feature about this, and it ties very well into your question. It has wireless power. These wireless devices are completely wireless. No batteries, no power lines, they just work. And then when you realize this is available, ABB has products like this, then you can start to think, wow, really wireless devices. Maybe that opens up totally new areas of applications, totally things that you didn't think were possible before suddenly becomes possible. Therefore, it's quite interesting. And to me, I think it's, it's a bit mind-boggling to have devices that are truly, truly wireless. So all this development of cheaper and faster and more low power, etc., when it comes to wireless communication, we need to take advantage of that. And we try to do that. But still, if you look out in the, in, in the industry, there are not so many applications when it comes to wireless communication. And you might wonder why. Why is that? Shouldn't there be room for more? Yeah, I think it is. But uh, maybe we are too slow in bringing products out. Or maybe the customers are a bit reluctant on trying out new technology. But for sure, this is coming. And this wireless power supply or power harvesting, where you sort of suck power out of your environment. You have light, you have heat, you have uh, vibrations. There are a lot of power sources in a plant. You can use that power, turn it into energy, so that you can just power your sensor, power a small radio, and then you have a totally wireless transmitter. Quite interesting. Another area, advanced control, optimization. Let's say that you have a process, any process, and you have a process limit. If you go above this process limit, then you might have uh, too low quality, uh, you might wear out the equipment too much, or uh, you have some too high emissions or something like that. So you want to stay below this limit. But you want to stay as close as possible. So you set the set point, the green set point for the plant, to operate as close as but below the limit. If you can build knowledge about your process, about your plant, into your control solution, then you can bring the variance down. You get the best control over the plant. And that in itself is quite interesting. But the really interesting part is that by using that, you can increase the set point. You can operate closer to the limit, 
which really means money. You squeeze more production or productivity out of an existing plant just by controlling, optimizing it in a better way. Sounds very easy, but what you need to do is that you need to build a model of this process. So you need to describe this model mathematically in some way. Uh, and this description needs to be complex enough so that it really describes how this process behaves. That is on one hand. On the other hand, it needs to be simple enough so that you can really use this model to optimize this online in real time. And there are different ways of, uh, of doing this. But when you have this model, then you can really, this is a very simplified model, then you can really use the model to, to minimize the energy consumption or maximize the, maximize the throughput or, or uh, ma minimize the time to shift between two different product qualities or something like that, or a combination of that. So once you have a model, it can really be used to make more money in your process, in your plant. We have an example. This is a, what is called a flotation process. It's in a mining. You take up some ore from the mines. Then you want to separate the minerals here and the rock here, so to say. Then you grind the, the ore. Then you put it into water. You add detergent, so you get a lot of foam. Then the minerals attaches itself to the foam, goes up to the top of the tank, and then you can take it away, and the rock goes down to the bottom. Sounds very easy. It's very complicated. You have a lot of tanks and recirculations and, and uh, stirring and, and adding chemicals, etc. So all flotation plants in the world are operated in manual by very, very experienced operators. So we thought that oh, this must be possible to do. We can build a model. We can optimize this plant. So we went to a big mining company in Sweden called Boliden, and we said that we can do that, this for you. And they said, no, you can't. This is impossible. We have tried 25 years with every expert in the world. It can't be done. We were quite confident. We said, yes, it can. We can do it. And finally, we succeeded in convincing Boliden, OK, you can try. So we worked for a couple of years. And at the end, we had the evaluation. We ran four months. Two months, two days in automatic, two days in manual, two days in automatic, two days in manual. And we proved to Bully then that the automatic was increasing the throughput of one to two percent units. Doesn't sound very much, but each percent unit is around one million dollars on the bottom line for Bully then. Using advanced mathematics to make money. Quite interesting. So this is coming more and more, because there is so much to gain by increasing the productivity of your existing plants. So this is becoming more and more interesting, and we are working quite a lot with it. Uh, the next area, visualization or user interaction or operator environment. This is how it looked like, like uh, 100 years ago. Very proud operator controlling his plant. Full view, full overview. He could go down and look into individual values. He could uh, uh, change values in the plant. Uh, in the 60s, the same thing, but more, more complex. In the 70s, they started to think that, well, we need flexibility as well. We need to change. When we change the layout of the plant, we want to change the control room. So they started to use modules. Put modules together to really tailor make your control room. The problem was that you have thousands of cables interconnecting these modules. And once you have got it to work, then you don't touch it. So good idea, didn't work very well. So that's why you started to use screens. Very easy to, to redraw a picture on the screen and change your operator environment. And you use keyboards and mouses and trackballs or whatever to change values, to input data, etc. So you have basically the same functionality as the proud operator had in the 1920s. Except one thing. I think you are lacking overview. To compensate for that, many companies, they build an overview panel somewhere in the control room. The problem is how many of the operators in this control room are looking at the overview? 
exactly zero. Everybody is focusing on their particular piece of the problem. And that is a problem. That is why we have sort of brought back the overview into the integrated operant environment with the product we call Extender Operator Workplace, where you have the overview, you have the details, you have the ability to interact with the system and your process in one integrated environment. So this is state of the art today. But what about the future? What will come after this? Well, maybe something like this. Oh, I love this part. I've got no address, last known or otherwise. No tax returns for the last five years. Check NCIC, maybe he's got a record. I'll send a protection team as soon as we lock location. It looks like federal housing, concrete and glass egg crates. Ouch, but a thousand of those in the district. Fractured images coming in. Numbers nine, nine and six. Female, senior, she's smoking a pipe. She's laughing. So what did you have here? It was Tom Cruise from the movie Minority Report, 2003, like uh, nine years ago. When I saw this the first time, I thought, wow, this is really fantastic. This is really science fiction, far into the future, so futuristic. But what did he have? I mean, he had a big screen with multi-touch. Did you notice how he zoomed into information like this? Have you seen this anywhere else? How did he change information like this? Have you seen this? Maybe Apple moved, uh, watched this movie, got some ideas, maybe, I don't know. So the technology is here already. You have this kind of technology available today. How can that change the role of the operator? Something else. What are these guys doing? Nice oh. show! Oh, wow! Oh. Oh. Nice shot! Love 15. Sure, they are playing computer games. Nintendo released Wii in 2006, which completely changed and revolutionized the com gaming, computer gaming industry with this Wiimote, not the remote, the Wiimote. A wireless device, street price 30 euro, that can uh, communicate, that knows how you're moving it, how you're orienting it, has accelerometers inside it. You could build such a thing before they re released it, but then maybe the price was 1,000 euro, something like that. So very important lesson here is that some technology enters consumer market, volumes go up, costs go down, and maybe you find new applications for it. Now you have uh, accelerometers and these kind of sensors in every mobile phone, I would say, at least every smartphone. Is this useful in industrial applications? Well, maybe. We had to try, so we took a Wiimote and thought, maybe you can program a robot using this. Just show the, program, the robot how to move. Up here, move here, drop down, uh, rotate a bit, and do like this. And it worked quite well. So this is, this is some of the examples of the things that we try out in the corporate research lab. OK, that was Nintendo. So what happened then? Once again, computer gaming, Kinect, Microsoft response to the Nintendo Wii. Came 2010, big success, I would say. The fastest selling gadget ever at that point in time. They sold millions in a very short time period. So what is it? This is a gadget, once again, 100 euro, approximately street price. Quite fantastic, it has a three-dimensional camera, three-dimensional microphone system, 
face recognition, voice recognition, some tilting motors. So this gadget can keep track of a number of people in a room, who they are, where they are, what they are doing, what they are saying, how they are moving in real time. If someone said three years ago, you could buy a device like that for 100 euro, I would say totally impossible. So what has this to do with industrial automation? Quite a lot, I would say, because with such a device, you can do a lot of things. Of course, there are a lot of, of uses for knowing what people are doing around machines, for instance, for safety. I would say there is no robot lab in the whole world that does not have at least one of these devices. So very interesting and very useful technology. The next step might be something like this. This is from a Swedish uh, research institute called R Interactive Institute. They released a product actually called Brain Ball. So you sit down, and the, the objective is to move this ball over to the goal here. So you sit down, oppose each other, you put a band around your head that measures your brain waves. And then you use the brain waves, nothing else, to control the movement of the ball. And it actually works. I tried it. You need to relax because you need to have as few, as little brain waves as, as possible. Maybe as stupid as possible. No, it doesn't work like that. Uh, you need to be relaxed. So I tried it. I always like to win when I compete. So I sat down opposite my opponent, and I was really relaxed, really eager to win. And when the ball was around here, I was sitting here, then I started to think, yes, I'm going to win. I started to think a lot of brain waves, and the ball came back, and there was nothing I could do, and I lost. It really, it really works. Yeah, it, it's a heavy table, so you can't even tilt it. So. But it really works. So do we believe that in the future all industrial plants will be controlled by just by thinking? Open this valve, start this motor. No, we don't. But as a, as a complement, maybe monitoring the stress levels of users, and based on that, present different amounts of information or tailor make the, the information. <laughs>mounted in a table so that you can gather around it. A number of people can work with the same information, share information, put IDs, put phones on the table that will be recognized. So you can send information to your phone or pick up information. You can allocate tasks. So of course we bought a couple of these tables and are working on providing nice concepts and prototypes, how this can really add value for uh, process plants around the world. These are screenshots from playing computer games. When you're sitting in front of a computer in a control room in an industrial plant, it doesn't look like this. And I think that is good. It, it doesn't look like this. But maybe something can be learned from this. Maybe there are situations where uh, very modern 3D graphics can really help the operator to perform his task more better or in a more safe way. We have been exploring that. We have been cooperating with gaming companies. There is a big gaming company in Sweden called Digital Illusions that make Battlefield, which is quite a, a, a famous uh, computer game. So we've been working with them because they are experts in creating real-time uh, environments and physical simulations. So we can learn a lot from them. 
Uh, so one thing we did was that we made a 3D model of a plant because we went out and then analyzed how they are working in this plant. And, and, and we saw that they had every morning they had a meeting where they discussed the production, their target values, etc. So we thought that why not make use of modern technology to help them to do this even better. So this is a model of the plant by importing CAD models that they already had. So everyone at the plant, they recognize this. You have main KPIs down here, like number of accidents, production rate, uh, uh, current stock levels, or what have you. The most important KPIs of this plant. So you can look at them, you can in inspect, you can discuss around them. Uh, you have more values around here. You can, of course, navigate this. Look at some values from further into the plant. And everybody knows exactly what you're talking about because they really know their plant. You can collect data from ABB systems or from third party systems, no problem. You could also, we saw that they were using whiteboards and post-it notes, so why not integrate that as well? So you can pull down a whiteboard, so you can draw directly on the screen, make notes. Or post-it notes. And we did a pilot installation of this at the pulp and paper plant in North Sweden. We said that the pilot uh, trial was for three months. After three months, we said, we are coming to take, the, take it back and get your feedback. And they say, you are not taking this back. And we said, yeah, well, we, we were agreed on three, three months. More or less, they said, if you try to take it back, we will kill you. And they didn't express it like that. But they refused to turn it back. So they really love this way of working. We continued to, to develop the, the concept with even nicer graphics, etc. So what we are seeing here is that we have moved from a way of interacting with computers. In the past, we, tried, we typed commands, print, change directory, uh, open, uh, run, etc. Now we are using more graphical user interface, you, using a mouse and Windows, etc. But we are moving towards a more natural user interface, directly directly in the interacting with the computers by talking to it, gesturing, uh, multi-touch, uh, looking. I mean, the computer can know exactly where you are looking on the screen, and you can use that, of course. And this builds on skills that you have already. Let's take a closer look at this and, and actually uh, watch what happens when you're operating it. Absolutely. My colleague here is... Uh, the red dot you see there. Now that going to pull out some information the from, uh, is from the control exactly system, where his guys, but he where cannot he, touch the, uh, the, the computer screen. or the screen because he has uh, very thick gloves in a greasy environment. So he is uh, using his eyes to look at things in the 3D model. And when he makes a swiping gesture, uh, those objects will be selected and brought to the left screen. And the schematics view gets zoomed in on that object so we know where it is in relation to all the other uh, objects in the system. And now we can look at the alarm list. And just by looking at that box, the alarm list zooms out and you can see the current alarms for that uh, object. And in the same way, you can look at the graphical trends and see how the values for that object have changed in the last few minutes. And uh, you can navigate the model up and down just by using his gestures and swipe in any, any object he needs. And this stream of objects that he has selected will also be transferred to his uh, smartphone or his tablet so he can bring them with him when it's con continuing his work. So really trying to take advantage of the latest available technologies to find new ways of interacting with computers in an industrial environment. Whenever we do something like this, we work in what we call a model called user-centric development. We go out and look and study and talk to our users. We go out to the mine operators, we go out on ships, we go out to, to power plants, to steel mills, etc., to really observe our users. What are their environments? What are their challenges? What are their main tasks? Uh, what is their working conditions? Then we 
make some analysis really to find patterns in this. We see what technology is available out there and then we make prototypes, concept prototypes on paper or on a screen or something like that. Then we go out to the users again and show, okay, we understood that you had this situation, these problems. Would something like this be able to make your life easier? Yes, they say, or no. And then we have to go back and modify our, our concepts. Thereby, we know that what we are doing is something that our users really appreciate. So this is becoming more and more important. But all of this is really driven from the media industry, from the entertainment industry, from the communication industry. So we need to take advantage of that. And we need to turn it into useful features for the future operators. Because a big challenge for all companies, especially in the Western world, is how to get the generation that is raised with mobile phones and social media and computer games to really want to work in the industry. Because it's in the industry where we make our money. In Sweden, I mean, 50, 60, 70 percent of all the money we make in Sweden is made in the base industries. We need to have competent people also in the future. I don't know if you recall what Tom Cruise said when he entered the control room. He said, oh, I love this part. I wonder how many process operators that say that when they come to the work in the morning and go into the control room. Oh, I love this part. I don't think so. So maybe we need to make products that are also more fun to use. Because these are the future operators and plant personnel. And we need to start to think about them. Uh, when you talk about automation and manufacturing things, if you want to manufacture something in high volumes uh, and, and not a lot of flexibility, you build a special machine. If you need maximum flexibility, then you do it manually. And then in between, somewhere, you have robots. There is one disadvantage of robots, and that they are potentially dangerous. So you need to put them into cages. You need to have safety equipment. But if you could combine robots and humans working at the same, working together, then there is a white spot here, actually. So we looked at that. If you could mix humans and robots in a safe way, with full flexibility, then there are a lot of possibilities. But then you need to address this safety thing, this uh, ease of use, this flexibility, this robustness, etc. So we did that. And we worked with uh, a concept robot called Frida. Can stop there. When you are trying to design a robot that will interact directly with humans, design becomes extremely important because the appearance of the robot to the human that is supposed to cooperate with the robot is extremely important. So we worked a lot with industrial design when we designed, when we, we developed this robot. Uh, and we were very proud of the results, so proud that we, we applied Frida for a big uh, industrial design competition or, or an award called Red Dot. Red Dot is the most prestigious this industrial design uh, award you can get in the industry. Uh, last year there were 3,536 3, entries into this award, into this competition. Uh, 252 got the Red Dot award, we got it. 
43, even got the red dot best of the best. In a certain category, the best industrial design in the world during the year. So we got that. There were three contestants for the red dot luminary, the best overall design concept in the whole world for the whole year. And we came at place number two. And we were extremely proud of that, I must say. So industrial design is very, very important. And this is something that will become more and more important in the future, I'm totally sure. So now we are testing it. Still a concept robot, so we are testing it together in, in some real world applications. Really working, you see here, the robot interacting with human operator. And the thing with this robot is that it's totally safe. You cannot be harmed by this robot. And there are a lot of things built into the basic design of it to prevent it from harming uh, human beings. So, have a lot of things here. What do they have in common? You see all these things, all these gadgets. You would need a, a big uh, truck to carry them around. Today, of course, you have them in your mobile, in your smartphone. Everything is in your smartphone. Isn't that quite fascinating? Is this useful for industrial applications? Of course it is. It's a device that knows everything, has contact to everything. Quite a powerful graphics, computing power, storage power. It knows where it is, GPS. It knows how you're holding it, a compass. It knows how you're moving it, gyrometers and accelerometers. Of course it can be used. Carry information around and have access to information wherever you are in the plant. Memory is another fascinating thing. Do you know what this is? It's a diskette. Fantastic. I used, uh, when I had diskettes, I could put all my documents on a diskette. Sometimes I needed two. Today, you are using memory sticks. A memory stick up to 128 gigabytes. That corresponds to 96,000 diskettes. That's amazing, right? And it was a good, in 1984, the world really had waited for the final storage solution. And it was uh, really released then. For only $3,400, you got 10 megabytes of storage space. space. Fantastic, wasn't it? Now you buy two terabytes for 100 euro. I mean, that is 1,390,000 floppies. And you fill them. They get full. So much information. And you talk about the Internet of Things. It's projected that around 2020, there will be 1 billion fixed connections to the Internet, 5 billion mobile connections, and 50 billion things will be connected to the Internet. So we human beings will be a small minority on the Internet. Consider all the information that flows around and that will continue to flow around. What enormous potential there is to really take advantage of this information. Because information that you don't use is useless. So there are a lot of things that you can do, do and have to do. When you made presentation yesterday, you had these uh, big, uh, nice uh, overhead projectors. Now you're using projectors like these instead. But didn't I say that everything should fit in the phone? So really, you should have the projector in the phone, right? But that is not possible. Well, it is, actually. It is possible. This is a projector. It's not as powerful as this one. Of course it's not. But it does work. I can show you. Well, I can show you some photos. I can tell you about my uh, uh, vacation trip, perhaps, uh, if you're interested. No, you're not. So I will, not, I will skip that. But uh, you can watch photos, like here. You can wash it in the, in the ceiling. You can wash it on my stomach or in my hand or something like this. Quite fascinating, because now you can also share information. And there are phones available with projectors built in, or sleeves that you can put your iPhone in. And suddenly, all the information you have here as personal can be shared and can be projected on the environment. So a lot of interesting possibilities there. There is even a camera with built-in projectors from Nikon. Augmented reality, where you sort of overlay interesting information on top of the reality. That was a big thing 10 years ago. Everyone was talking about augmented reality. 
And then you needed some special goggles. This was an early prototype, I think. Uh, quite interesting. <laughs> uh, special goggles so that you can project things on when you walked around like this with your goggles and you looked like very strange. Uh, and then it died. Totally silent. Then two years ago, it came back again. And why? Because of this. This is a perfect augmented reality device. You have the camera. You can project whatever you see in the camera here. And then you can overlay in interesting digital information. So that you can move around in a plant. You get a, an alarm, some high vibration on the pump. You send it out to the, to the maintenance guy. He doesn't know exactly where it is, so he gets some direction. It's over there, four, meter, four meters to the right. Uh, this is the one. And you get some more information about this uh, uh, part of the plant. So he knows what happens when it turns this motor off, for instance. What else is hot? Well, whenever this guy, uh, Stephen Jobs or Tim uh, Cook nowadays, when they release a new iPhone or something like that, what happens? Well, quite interesting. People start to sleep outside Apple stores. They, because they want to be the first to buy the new phone. I think we have fantastic motors and low voltage switch gear and robots in ABB, but no one ever sleeps outside our factories when we release a new model. I mean, we need to shape up perhaps. And they release a big iPhone that you can't even call with, and people get crazy. I mean, they do something right, I think. This is a quite interesting comparison of Apple and Microsoft. And Microsoft is quite a successful company, bear that in mind. This is the value change of Microsoft during the last 10 years. Not impressive. Compared to Apple, quite impressive. 3,500%. And it has just continued. Now it's 6,000%. So obviously they do something wrong. Something right, I mean. They do a lot of things right. Maybe something wrong as well, but a lot of things right. For instance, the App Store. That was released in August 2008. In January, 2011, you could see this on Apple's uh, homepage. Thank you, 10 billion apps has, have been downloaded. 10 billion. In March this year, 25 billion apps have been downloaded. So every people on this planet, every person have downloaded an average four apps. That's quite the market penetration in four years. Apple gets 30% of all the revenues. I heard an average price of an app is $2.53. Then you can do the maths and see whether it's a good model or whether it's an exceptionally good business model. Very interesting. And the good thing is that it's an excellent business model also for the developer, because they get to keep 70% and get worldwide distribution, marketing, money, currency handling, etc. And they get 70% net. So very nice. So I think when you, when you have reached a state where your competitors come out with, hmm, killers, then you are really doing something right. So you can read every week, more or less. This is some Swedish uh, paper clips, but I am sure you have that here as well. Now HTC has an, uh, Samsung, they have this new iPhone killer. I really looked at the net, I, really f I found an iPhone killer. It really is out there, and it looks like this. This is the iPhone killer. And it works on all iPhones, totally compatible. And it even works on iPads. It's an Israeli artist that really sells this iPhone killer. And it really works. I, I know, I haven't tried it because... Another interesting area that is going to change the world, we just don't know how, is 3D printers. Now you can print things, not just on paper, but in 3D. You can print your own stuff. It is not as fast as this. This is uh, speeded up quite significantly, but it works. And today it's plastics. Today it's single material, single color. It's slow, it's expensive. Will it stay that way? No way. It will not, and it will change a lot of things. So this is also something we need to keep track of and bear in mind. How will it affect our business in the future? Social media. Some interesting facts last year. I mean, Facebook, 800 million users, 200 million new users. You had 8.1 billion SMSs sent last year. You had 107 trillion emails, 89% spam, but still quite a lot of interesting emails. 
You had 190 million tweets per day. You had 4 billion viewings on YouTube every day. Who could have thought that 10 years ago? I would say no one, because this didn't even exist except email and, and SMS 10 years ago. An enormous speed of penetration of the market is what we are seeing now. And how are we taking advantage of that in the industry? I would say not very much. Not to the extent that we have to do in the future. So we need help from younger people to really take advantage of this. We are looking at this, of course. We have a lot of students coming in, doing thesis works, etc. In, in our lab. So we're looking at how can we take advantage? How can we build like a Facebook for a plant? Maybe a plant book where people can communicate in the plant. And in the future, when we have this Internet of Things, when we will have 50 billion uh, devices that will co also communicate, connect to this plant book, then it, things might become very, very interesting indeed. So these are very important directions for us. So then I have the last gadget, the Puchi Puchi. This is a fantastic gadget. This was extremely popular in Japan like three or four years ago. But what is it? What is it? Well, do you know what bubble plastic is? The thing that you wrap sensitive stuff in. What, when you have unwrapped it, what do you do with the bubble plastic? You pop it, right? You do? But when you popped it, what happens? You can't pop it again. This is a bubble plastic emulator. So you have eight eternal bubbles. So you can pop, pop till you drop. And they didn't even stop that. They wanted to further develop the concept. So every 100 pops, you get a surprise sound, like meow, poof, or something like that. It's so amazing. It's a fantastic device. We are so impressed. So we come back to this now. One of these gadgets have to go, because it can't be. We haven't found a use for it yet in industrial uh, automation. And it has to be the Pucci Pucci. It's fantastic, but we don't know how to use it, really. So maybe you have some nice ideas, and I can take this cross out. So a very quick summary. I found a clip. This is in Swedish, but it's in techno technology. Technology is a sort of very universal language. So I think you will understand this. So we, what we need to do is to understand what is happening around out there, and we need to apply it to an industrial environment. And that is what we are doing. Raida, printa, sippa, jolta, selda, kefka, flema, feida, vorbis, bitrate, kwebe, ps, agro, kritish, respawn, newbie, blu-ray, dolby, ipad, android, surya, laser, google, linux, windows, sevia, pixel, krikta, krakka, beira, surfa, mona, zona, shvega, maura, visa, vares, ripa, fjala, pizza, skypa, moda, torma, tira, trojan, expo, kiemu, moana, rf, f2, xa, bio, spin-off, lishki, gd, titlor, jolpa, doisi, dreamhack, mayday, crack throat, hilda, digi, so we need to keep up with what is happening out there, and we really try to do that, to make the best possible products for automation, not only today, but also tomorrow. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lagerberg, for Thank this you. very lively presentation. I think that's excellent according to our innovation day to day. So, uh, we have here a magic box where from actually some of the questions appear in our time intervals, and <laughs> we may see here some of them. So, the first one would be, in your opinion, is ABB pulled by technology or is ABB pushing technology? <laughs> uh, I, th I think it's both. I, in some areas, we need to push, uh, push technology, absolutely. In some areas, we need to be the leaders. In some areas, we need to be fast followers. We need to be, see what is out there. I mean, we cannot develop our own, we cannot be the leaders in software, in wireless communication, but we need to be the leaders in applying it mm -hmm. for industrial applications. So I think it, it's, yes, both. Okay. So the second one would be, how do you teach Frida? That is a big <laughs> challenge. And, and that is, in, in, the, in the, what we have today, we, you are programming it in the same way as we do all our other, other industrial robots. But this is something we're investigating, whether we can really simplify the teaching of Frida. That is uh, something we are working on right now. So. Okay. And then we have a third question here. How to choose communication channel for real-time fast automation, distances 300 kilometers? 
Ah, we have to take advantage of, of, of uh, what is out there. We cannot develop our own protocols. We need to take, because I mean, everything goes faster and faster and, and longer, long, longer distances. So we take advantage of 3G, 4G, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, WiMAX, whatever is available there. So I mean, we have to sort of look at what communication infrastructure are there available and, and really hook onto that and adapt it to industrial uh, needs. OK. Mr. Lagerberg, thank you very much. Thank you. And here a small present also thank for you. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Selle esa elava presentatsiooniga olemegi jõudnud suhteliselt finissi joone lähedale meie tänase innovatsioonipäevaga. Enne kui me aga päriselt lõpetame selle päeva, soovin teile rääkida paar sõna ja kutsuda ka lavale, et ABB tudengi konkursi losalejad. Esmalt aga paar sõna sellest tudengi konkursist. ABB aktsis elts kuulutas eelmisel nädalal välja tudengi konkursi, kuhu ootasime kandideerima eelkõige energeetika- ja mehaanikateaduskonna üliõpilastest koosnevaid võistkondi. Tänaseks on konkursile pääsenud võistkonnad selgunud ja kohe jagame nende võistkondade esindajatele kätte töökofrid. Ja need töökofrid sisaldavad päikese paneeli, Alaisvoolu mootorit, toiteallikat ja ABB AC500 kontrollerit. Nendest komponentidest tuleb võistkondadel kahe nädala jooksul ehitada programmeeritud töötav seade. Ülesanet lähemalt tutvustav kohtumine võist, võistkonna esindajatele toimub täna kohe pärast seminaari ning soovime kõikidele võistkondadele edu, sest peauhinnaks on ABB, Rootsi, Teadus ja Tootmiskeskuse külastus. Nüüd palun lavale. Võistkonnad, nimede järgi ja nende esindajad, siis esindajad võistkondadest. AEP, esindaja Tanel Sinijärv. Võistkond TTÜ roboti, Robotiklubi, esindaja Siim Sülla. Võistkond VTP, esindaja Taavi Klaus. Võistkond Haki, esindaja Martin Grossberg. Ja siis on vist võistkond nimega võistkond, esindaja Kristjan Vilgo. Ja võistkond troonikus esindaja Sander Sööt. Olgem head. Soovin teile siis edukat insenneerimist. Edu ja õudu. Loomingulist lähenemist. Nii, hea peale hakkamist. Loodetavasti. Head kuulajad, sellega ongi meie innovatsioonipäev ja seminaar tänaseks lõppenud. Küsimused, mis täna ei leidnud vastust, saavad vastatud järgmise nädala jooksul ABB kodulehel abb.ee kaltkriips 20 ja samalt aadressilt on teil võimalik hiljem leida ka presentatsioonid. Sellega lõpetangi käesulev ürituse. Loodetavasti leidsite midagi, mida endaga täna siit kaasa võtta, Võibolla ehk midagi sellist, millega juba homme alustada maailma muutmist. Ma tänan teid ja nüüd üks aplaus teile kõigile. <tus>